Um, this topic is reflexive urbanization. <coughs> now, we talked about what the word reflexive means. The doctor says, uh, cross your legs, you cross your legs, and he hits it with a hammer, and what happens? Your knee automatically, without you <coughs> thinking about it, kicks up. That was an automatic <coughs> reflex. Okay, so reflexive, the root of the word reflexive is the word reflex, and you know how that works because we've all been to the doctor. The second meaning of the word reflex is that it operates on itself. So something that operates on itself, for example, a thermostat is a reflexive mechanism. As soon as the thermostat says it's too cold, it turns on the furnace. The furnace heats up the house, and through that process, the thermostat shuts off the furnace, and it repeats in that automatic feedback loop unless you're at the Wentworth Institute of Technology and there's a big thermostat over across the campus and they control the temperature of every room from that one central point, um, ignoring 100 years of experience of the thermostats are the better way to do it. So um, the uh, overarching idea of reflexivity is that systems operate best when they operate in a self-referential uh, and self-correcting way. So any system that corrects itself is operating reflexivity, uh, reflexively. Systems, we tried on Tuesday to come up with examples of systems that do not operate through a reflexive feedback loop. And they're difficult to identify because they no longer exist. They lead to collapse. If they don't self-correct, they collapse. And um, this is a topic that we start right out uh, looking back at the first three lecture topics. So number one, two, and three on your list might be that the city as a cosmos is a system of deliberate diagrams. That uh, is, that's one big theme of the way cities work. The second big theme that we looked at is the city as a system, or a system of systems. That these systems operate uh, or not, depending on the spatial arrangement of the city. And the third uh, big theme of the course, and of cities in general, is the city as an organism in which cities operate through emergent phenomena. So local values and local rules, like in the city of Islam, have a way of registering on the urban fabric. Uh, the modesty of women that is enforced by Islamic law leads to a specific formal arrangement. The uh, manner of self-building housing uh, of informal settlements registers as a physical pattern on the hillsides outside of Latin American cities in the informal settlements. So these are emergent phenomena. Now the question of reflexivity is to what extent do any of these uh, operations of cities in urban form self-correct? And the classic non-self-correcting example is the example of the radiant city. The radiant city is a city as cosmos. There's a, an enormous diagram uh, visualized by architects, uh, or the architect, Le Corbusier. And that gigantic pattern is implemented in places like Chandigarh and Brasilia. In Brasilia, and in either case, if there was no self-correcting mechanism, the cities would fail dramatically and miserably. But if there are self-corrective mechanisms, then, such as in Chandigarh, these vast open spaces will fill up with markets and they will operate quite well. Or in Brasilia, the single function of the diagram will give way to multiple functions within each super quadra, uh, super blocks of Brasilia. And so this city as cosmos diagram of Le Corbusier, uh, which has been criticized very effectively by James C. Scott and seen like a state, his way of talking about this reflexive operation is to refer to the Greek goddess Metis. Metis is like the wily fox of a Native American tradition or the jackal of the African folklore. Um, 
that metis is the ability to strategically uh, manipulate and seize opportunities wherever they exist. And this is uh, about flexibility, about opportunism, and it is one of the classic characteristics and time-honored strengths of things like capitalism, which is like a shark always swimming, always looking for the next opportunity for gain. And that is a masterful example of a reflexive system that is self-correcting. Um, the best example we have of a non-self-correcting system is also in the Radiant City, where Pruitt Igo, the public housing, where it's so it didn't work so dramatically. It failed so dramatically they had to, the only thing they could do is tear it down. And it was torn down uh, in, in a it was almost like the Medellin example. The government called a public meeting, and the residents uh, were challenged to come up with a solution to the Pruitt Igo problem. And their suggestion was to tear it down. There was a chant that came from the back, tear it down. And the government agreed, and they tore it down. Um, this is the moment that Charles Jenks points to as the end of modernism. He didn't just say modernism ended somewhere in the late 60s, early 70s. He didn't just say 73. He didn't say March 73. He said at exactly 342 and 46 seconds on March 23rd, 1973, the modern era ended, and we enter the postmodern era. Um, of course, that's not true, um, but it was a useful uh, polemical point uh, that he made. Uh, in his argument uh, towards a postmodern architecture. Um, and I point to a moment in 2003, a mere uh, 30 years later, when postmodernism ended, um, when uh, a, a graduate student pointed out to a panel of global experts on postmodern theory that, um, that the sum total of all of this theory, theoretical ponderings, uh, of which architecture was a very important part, uh, didn't amount to much. And this, in the context he was raising is that Noam Chomsky's engagement uh, in real life issues on the ground amounted to much, much more than everybody who was on the stage. And this was, the context was, uh, this was two weeks after the American invasion of Iraq. Uh, and, and they ended up agreeing with them. That's the only reason we've heard this story, is because uh, the people on the panel agreed that their work of the last 30 years had been really destructive and distracting to the world. Um, and so we come up with the idea of uh, moving beyond the modern, postmodern idea, which I don't think we teach anymore, and not because we don't have time, but it's less and less important. So the question is, what now do we have? And some of us are working on the idea that reflexivity is the key attribute of the <clears throat> second modern period, that 21st century modernism is distinct and different from 20th century modernism in this way. In the 20th century, especially in architecture, we had a utopian vision, like Corbusier's Radiant City, and we imposed it. Uh, and if something goes wrong, the reason we give as architects and designers, we say, well, of course it's going wrong. You didn't implement it fully yet. When you implement it fully, everything will turn out well. Um, and in the 21st century, we now have the internet. We have communication. We have crowdsourcing. We have uh, a new set of tools and paradigms and access to opinions and viewpoints that allows us to uh, correct things on the fly reflexively. And so we have the classic feedback loop. This is a system operating without feedback, uh, as we had it in the 20th century, uh, where uh, the idea, the strength of the idea, is what drives us forward, as James C. Scott points out in Corbusier's Town Planning. Um, and in the 21st century, we have a new revival and strengthening of these feedback loops. So when something is not working, we uh, should now have the ability to correct it on the fly. 
And, but there are two types of feedback loops. There is positive feedback, as in a nuclear reactor. If you yank out the control <coughs> rods, the hotter the, the, the nuclear uh, reactor gets, the more it reacts and the hotter it gets. And then it melts down and you have the China syndrome like at Chernobyl and uh, almost at Three Mile Island. Uh, so this is when things go super critical, is when there's positive feedback, like when Jimi Hendrix holds the guitar up to the amplifier, positive feedback. Versus negative feedback, when something goes too far, the feedback loop says, up oh, too far, and it brings it back, like a thermostat. And so this is the kind of negative feedback loop that we like. As long as we create, we design it. Some people say that reflexive uh, reflexes are not something you can change. But what are we doing in school? What are we doing when we study martial arts? What are we doing when we study a foreign language? We are altering our reflexes. We are changing the response behavior. And in architecture, we talk about performativity. We are changing the performance of the architecture. And this is a governor uh, that is a natural feedback loop that uh, the faster the motor spins, the wider out these weights are driven, which slows down the spinning. And so this is a natural, you can set the, the weight and the position of these and they will swing out or swing in and regulate uh, the speed of the spinning, thus the name governor. For example, in the built environment, we have found that if you want to reduce traffic fatalities and accidents and slow down cars, you can put up a speed limit sign. And places like uh, uh, Storo Drive, where the speed limit is 45 miles an hour, but the road feels like it's a 65 mile an hour road, doesn't it? Um, and so no matter what the speed limit says on the sign, there is a feedback loop that says drive as fast as you want, stir or drive. Uh, and so instead of putting up traffic signs, we've started to use traffic calming, where we read the signals of the physical environment, and without thinking, we reflexively speed up or slow down. Uh, and so that's how traffic calming works. And things like traffic calming is the shared space idea I mentioned earlier. That uh, this is the driveway in the parking lot, but it's also the outdoor patio. If you put people in shared spaces, it forces bicyclists to suddenly become less insane. They start to behave like people. And the drivers stop acting like drivers, uh, dry, uh, car humans, as uh, uh, Uri mentioned in the automobility reading. Um, that you no longer are you a, a human in a car, a driver. Now you're a human operating a car, and you make eye contact. And so this has been an extremely effective mechanism going against all logic of, uh, the, that is our common sense. We put our children in the streets, and it slows down the cars. And this is called the Vonerf idea. Vonerf uh, means residential neighborhood in Dutch. And this has been common since World War II, since the end of World War II. Another famous feedback loop is the Kaizen movement of Japan uh, when they kicked Detroit butt uh, by creating better and better automobiles for less and less money because they had these feedback loops of constant total quality management and constant improvement, which is a cultural thing that if you ever work for a corporation, you will run into. This, of course, is Buckminster Fuller, who created uh, a world game uh, where he modeled the entire planet uh, in the Dymaxion map and put uh, resources, modeled the resources, and engaged people in a game for how to allocate resources in the name of world peace. Um, I was lucky enough to be a part of one of the last 
times he ran this right before his death. Um, it's not that different from what we now are able to do with computers in SimCity. And architecture is capable increasingly of setting up these feedback loop systems and building them right into our design process. So these things are driven not by formal visions as in the Corbusian sense, but by relationships. And there are two schools of thought on this. One is use these new tools to make beautiful blobs. Why? I don't know because we can, uh, and it's rather dissatisfying. Um, only slightly better is when we start to uh, use it in order to create uh, interesting experiences in public space, as in uh, Mei Jin Yoon's uh, light field uh, project, um, where she created one of these objects that when it moves, it generates power and lights up. And when you place these in a field, uh, and someone walks through it, it has quite uh, magical experiential qualities. And so this is the beginning of actually using some of these tools in a positive way. Um, and then there's simulations of responsive architectures in Second Life, uh, where architecture starts to respond to human presence. Now we're talking, now we're getting somewhere. Uh, architecture that acknowledges the presence of the human body and changes form accordingly. And this has actually been physicalized um, by Mark Goldthorpe at MIT. Uh, these uh, computer-driven actuators in a, in a wall um, to create things. And this uh, Philip Beasley in Canada uh, using uh, biological systems to create architecture that also responds to human presence in multiple different ways. Um, and again, we still have to ask the, uh, the question, why? So far, the answer uh, orbits somewhere around because we can and uh, why not. Um, the second movement um, that is identifiable in all of this is uh, the tendency to <coughs> Uh, go to solving problems in the urban realm. And so this first approach is to develop reflexive architectural uh, strategies or responsive architectures uh, because we can and for the sake of just exploring the possibilities. The second approach is to use reflexive strategies to solve actual problems and this leads us to the reading for uh, this week, which is a piece I published in 2009. The background to this is the idea that the problems of the 21st century are the direct result of the solutions of the 20th century. Another way of seeing that is that we were so successful in solving problems during the 20th century that they actually created unintended consequences that we did not predict at the time. Things like uh, nuclear proliferation, uh, planetary death, uh, concentration of wealth, uh, all of these problems were not the result of problems the way we have experienced them previously, but really the result of the successes, the unintended consequences of the successes of the 20th century. And so uh, if we expect to solve these problems uh, using the same uh, approaches to problem solving that we used in the 20th century, we are probably in for disappointment. Albert Einstein famously said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. And so it calls for a new approach uh, to our problems if we want to prevent uh, further problems from emerging down the line. This is the essence of what reflexivity allows us to uh, do. It allows us to monitor the new unintended consequences that emerge from our solutions and to respond agilely and quickly to them in order to uh, reduce and mitigate their impacts. And to do this, uh, it's, uh, design has a special role. 
uh, if the 20th century problems, our successes in the 20th century, were the result of focusing very narrowly on specific problems like a, you know, curing diseases, solving transportation problems, uh, a lot of these solutions came about because uh, very smart people focused very narrowly on narrowly defined questions. Um, the, the, the advantage of design is that it has the capacity for integrating multiple considerations into a single response and taking the measure of diff the values of different uh, inputs from multiple different expertises. So collaborative processes brought together in a design problem-solving framework is, uh, in many people's minds, the key strategy for moving forward in the 21st century. Uh, the Dutch have a special insight into this process. Uh, since the 9th century, uh, the Dutch have been faced with a serious challenge. Uh, during the 9th century, a f flooding from the North Sea uh, wiped out a significant portion of the country and a significant portion of the population. Their choice was to either uh, move or uh, do something about the landscape. And so they chose to stay, and they famously built dikes and windmills to drain the water out of the low-lying areas. The word Netherlands means low-lying lands. About half the country is at or below sea level. And the thing about a dike is that if, there are, if there's a whole village of 30, 40, 50 households, uh, that are responsible for maintaining the dike as it passes over their land, it turns out that the dike is only as strong as its weakest link. If one of those 50 households neglects their dike, then the entire village is uh, in jeopardy. And so it resulted in what people call a polder mentality. Uh, the polder is the low-lying area, and the polder mentality uh, manifests as a social cohesion, a collective decision-making culture that uh, was the key to Dutch survival up to the present. Uh, the flooding occurred uh, again, the worst flooding in centuries occurred in 1953 that came as a reminder to uh, how the Dutch need to play, pay very close attention to the built environment as a design platform uh, of intervention. The entire landscape is a built environment. And so we see here in 1850, uh, this is a view of what is called the Ronstadt, a circle of cities in central Holland, the, the, the most densely populated area of one of the most densely populated countries of the world. Uh, and you see the difference between 1850 and for 1940 uh, you see a very intense uh, urbanization process over the course of those 90 years. And you start to see uh, a ring. Um, you also see the uh, gradual disappearance of a great deal of water. This is to drain the lands in order to uh, increase the agricultural uh, capacity of the Randstad. So it is not just an urban system, it is also an agricultural system. And so the open space plays a crucial role in food production. So from 1940 to 1970, we see again a very uh, significant uh, intensification, enlargement of the cities. But these are cities growing at very high densities. You see also a reduction in some of the remaining waterways. And you start to see the, the ring of cities uh, with Amsterdam at the north, uh, Harlem just west of Amsterdam, and then moving south along the coast, uh, we see Leiden, Delft, and then Rotterdam at the bottom, uh, surrounding a open agricultural area uh, that is the green heart of the Netherlands. Uh, off to the east, we have the smaller cities of Utrecht, uh, etc., and the ring is completed. Uh, it's the Instead of a freeway system, the Randstad is based on a intercity rail system that interconnects the city centers. Um, there are freeways that is uh, interesting in that 
it is about the sa same size as Southern California, about the same population, and roughly uh, similar economic uh, output sizes. So the comparison is very telling. Um, if we did have a comparison uh, drawn in the same way of Southern California, it would be more pink, less white, less deep red, a lot of pink. Uh, moving forward in time to the year 2000, you see the further uh, proliferation of city centers. Uh, there's a deregulation process like many other parts of the world. The government uh, pulled back on their regulations and one of those pullbacks came in land use regulations and so there's a lot more development uh, in the green heart but still in a highly concentrated form. Uh, but it has been a struggle. It turns out that the biggest argument in favor of high concentration uh, is both is not just transportation but also allowing uh, free space for flooding to occur. Um, now throughout this period of transition the Dutch uh, have made use of something that has come to be known as uh, information design. Uh, if you've heard of Edward Tufte you may have seen this map. Uh, the central premise of information design is that the content of the information is important, but it's not the whole story. Uh, the information contained in this map of Napoleon's uh, military campaign to Moscow uh, in 1812 uh, shows, uh, through the thickness of the line, the size of the forces. And uh, it shows the geographic uh, relationship uh, between um, the front lines as they move towards Moscow. It also shows at the bottom the temperature on the trip back towards, um, towards the Nimes River. Uh, by showing it in this way, as compared to showing the same information in a spreadsheet, the information comes to life. And this is one of the key uh, bits of evidence that Tufte uses to make his point that the meaning of information is as much or more about the presentation, the design of the presentation, than it is the information itself. This information locked away in a spreadsheet would not tell the same story. And uh, this is extended into the idea of the demonstration effect. And of course, the uh, my favorite, the Missouri rules uh, that don't say anything that you can't also show us not allowed to say it unless you're showing it to us. Um, a kindred spirit in all of this is Bruce Mao. Um, he was the graphic designer for Ram Kohlhaas's um, small, medium, large, extra large book. Um, and he, in 2004, uh, published this book uh, filled with uh, very clear information design uh, demonstrations. This one is of the internet. It was also a traveling ex exhibition that um, used three-dimensional demonstrations to convey knowledge about the need for a rapid transformation of the world. In the, back in the Netherlands, here we are at the Netherlands Architecture Institute. This is the uh, ground floor space underneath the building. And this was the site of one of the most famous uh, information design uh, demonstrations. In 1995, the National Housing Authority of the Netherlands estimated that in the next 20 years that the Netherlands would need to construct 800,000 dwelling units in order to satisfy the demand in the Netherlands, uh, thus impacting the sequence of that map uh, that we were looking at just a moment ago. And there was a political discussion of whether or not the current pattern should be continued of high-density, uh, small footprint, uh, urban residential fabrics, or shifting to a more single-family North American paradigm for housing development. And so the architect turned landscape architect, uh, Adrian Hauser of West 8, uh, staged this demonstration. He asked the question, what does 800,000 houses look like. 
And so he had these houses built. He arranged them uh, sometimes in scattered patterns. Sometimes he invited his designer friends to propose more interesting arrangements. Uh, and they all put them together and demonstrated what it looks like to add 800,000 new single-family houses, uh, telling the story that it almost doesn't matter what the house looks like or what the settlements look like. It is such a, an enormous transformation of the landscape that uh, the Netherlands can ill afford to fill the landscape with this many houses. Um, this was related to uh, this approach was related to a competition for a piece of land uh, that was put out for development somewhere in the Green Heart. I believe it was somewhere around here. And in the competition, uh, the designers took a similar approach. They took a single project. Uh, each one of them would take a single project. Uh, in this case, New Babylon, a uh, proposal from 1963, uh, and said, what if we uh, developed, the, extended this into a development of the, of the uh, Randstad. Uh, what would that look like? And so they visualized these extreme scenarios. Another one said, what would it look like if we used the Octcomp um, model uh, for housing? Uh, another one, uh, they also, well, this is the, the, the basis of it. They basically took the green heart that was mostly empty and decided to empty it completely except for the urban settlements and then fill that space up with these new housing proposals. And so here we have the Octcomp. Uh, another proposal was what would it be like if we only built within five kilometers of the rail stations that cross the green heart? Uh, because that's the comfortable distance for bicycling, which is the favorite way of getting around in the Netherlands. And so through, by testing these extreme scenarios, uh, the, the competition uh, entries were created a basis of comparison. Even though the proposal was not to fill the entire green heart, it was simply to propose a model for development of one small parcel of land uh, in one part of the green heart, they uh, chose to analyze the pros and cons of that proposal based on the speculation and the proposition that, that um, if the proposal were successful, that it could be applied more widely. And what would be the overarching impact uh, uh, of applying that solution? This approach has led uh, to some of the more provocative speculations that have come out of MVRDV, a group of Dutch architects who um, came out of Rem Kolhas's office. And you may be aware of their publication uh, about a decade ago of FAR max. FAR is floor area ratio. And they started with the premise, what if the entire population of the world were placed in a cube of space? one kilometer by one kilometer by one kilometer. Uh, what kind of solutions, uh, design solutions, would be necessary? Out of this speculation, they started to move into the area of software parametrics. And so here we see um, a simple experiment where building modules are either commercial, recreational, residential, or uh, cultural. And by showing different parameters, the computer will generate different arrangements. If you want to uh, maximize daylight uh, in a way that keeps the houses in red and the, par and the open space in green out of shadows, uh, you set the par parameters to favor those outcomes and the computer uh, spits out something like this. Uh, or for flexibility, um, for free expansion of the commercial units, you get something like this. And you can uh, start to mix considerations through a series of sliders. Um, this is not to be confused as being a replacement for design. In a way, this is a different kind of zoning approach, uh, setting of zoning configurations. 
Um, these experiments have been extended to analysis of transportation infrastructures uh, and uh, throughout they go from, it, just in order to evaluate, they often go from this type of Minecraft uh, landscape into architecturalizing it uh, to make it more uh, legible to uh, the general public. Uh, and this approach has been extended to uh, larger scale urban planning. Uh, in this case, where you get the generic Minecraft landscape of, of the larger image, and then it becomes architecturalized uh, in the manner of the smaller image. And so it yields uh, uh, quick speculations on the pros and cons of one approach or another. Um, this is the region maker that moves up in scale and eventually goes to covering uh, a modeling of the entire planet. This is uh, a very provocative and interesting proposal also by MVRDV in collaboration with MIT uh, that instead of these uh, planning documents that are obsolete almost as soon as they are published, um, planning often traditionally takes place uh, as the production of books that propose uh, guidelines for further development uh, for the next 20 years. But as soon as the first set of decisions are made, uh, it yields a whole new situation and it changes the opportunities and threats of any subsequent development. So arguably, and the history of planning documents shows this to be true, the uh, planning documents tend to be obsolete uh, very quickly and uh, there is a question, isn't there a better way to do planning? Well, Vinny Moss of MVRDV, he's the M of MVRDV, uh, has proposed that instead of a planning uh, publication that uh, he extends this idea of extreme scenarios, uh, extreme scenario testing, and the demonstration effect of information design to uh, creating a video game. So the replacement for planning documents is the coding of a video game. And this screen shows the different kinds of connections that are possible, uh, the economic considerations, um, the technological considerations, demographics, and environmental uh, parameters. And each of these are quantifiable, measurable uh, data points that can be linked and interconnected through something like Grasshopper and uh, generates uh, a modeling, a real-time modeling of the entire planet. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this prototype did not use Google Earth. It used its own very uh, unsatisfying, highly pixelized uh, version of the global model uh, and, and experimented with making very few connections, uh, then some more, and eventually getting to extremely complex interconnections that start to come closer to the way these different parameters are actually uh, connected in our world. And so we see here uh, some playing out of these uh, game scenarios. Here's a modeling of Dubai. Um, and you may recognize the palm uh, development off the coast of Dubai. Arguably, uh, this is just too crude to really be useful at all. But it does point to the possibility of uh, a future that uh, could utilize things like Google Earth and get closer to reality. Here is a parallel development by a colleague over at Emerson College called Community Planet in which uh, each community member uh, takes on an identity and walks through a second life type environment that is a model of their own neighborhoods and they uh, go on quests, they are given currency, they make spending decisions and throughout the plane of these games, data is accumulated that reflects the actual values of people in the community. Not their values as they reported on surveys, which have proven to be extremely uh, imprecise and um, uh, deceptive, but values in practice, where they're actually spending their money, where they're actually spending their time. Uh, and so this is a 
game playing uh, way of, of executing planning approaches. Um, and other things have been attempted. Here's uh, something closer to the reality um, that we experience day to day uh, using SketchUp, which conveniently has been purchased by Google. Uh, so here we have SketchUp in combination with Google Earth, and we can start to get a more realistic um, representation of the possible outcomes. Now, if you bring those crude, uh, cubic, pixelated uh, developments, bring them into a more precise and high-density, high-fidelity, high-resolution depiction of the planet, and combine them with some of the uh, parametric tools that architects have developed, the potential starts to uh, get somewhere that is actually useful in approaching the, the future uh, development um, that can incorporate complexity, uh, something on the order of what we actually experience it in the world, and uh, a complexity that can be experienced through virtual means. Uh, this is a far cry from um, what we would need to have in order to truly make uh, these three-dimensional models experiential, but the potential is there. And there are many people who are looking into this in one way or another, uh, including our friends over at the MIT Media Lab, where they are taking cell phone data uh, collected in real time to uh, keep track of actual uh, human experiential phenomena in space uh, in real time. Uh, and so we get things like this modeling of Singapore uh, made possible because of cell phones. And here we see a similar, a similar modeling of phenomena that starts to produce a topographic representation of certain phenomena. Uh, and if, as we bring together these large spatial mapping uh, tools with uh, parametric modeling, of uh, the architectural tools, we start to get uh, simulations that can really have the power of the demonstration effect uh, of Missouri rules. We can put these tools in the hands of designers of multiple scales and really engage with uh, publics uh, for the evaluating uh, and evaluation of multiple scenarios and figure out um, what are the unintended consequences, anticipate the unintended consequences before they manifest as problems in the landscape and start to respond uh, in a more agile manner in real time that is the promise of a reflexive approach of the 21st century that is in direct contrast to the more rigid modernisms uh, that we experienced uh, during the 20th century.